All right, let's get into our study in the book of Galatians. Our verse-by-verse study, we're in Galatians chapter number 2. We left off at verse 16. So we're going to read uh, verse 16 and then have a word of prayer. Galatians chapter number 2 and verse 16, Paul says to Peter, he says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, there shall us by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We do thank you for his precious shed blood on Calvary's cross, that innocent, impeccable blood, that powerful blood that uh, washes our sins away. We thank you, Father, that by faith alone, in Christ alone, we can have that everlasting life as a free gift today in the dispensation of grace. We thank you for uh, the faith of Christ, which we tap into as we walk by faith. And, and Father, uh, to, to build that reward, that reward of the inheritance for serving the Lord Christ. So, Father, as we look into your word, may you give us great insight, understanding, and wisdom of those things. And as well, always, and most importantly, give us a greater appreciation of your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus. We thank you for this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. When we talk about the faith of Christ, look at verse 16. Paul says, knowing that a man. Look at the start at verse 15. This is where Paul has to confront the apostle Peter. Uh, This is a wonderful passage to show Paul's authority here in the dispensation of grace. Uh, Peter, as everyone knows, was the head apostle to the nation of Israel. The Lord Jesus himself made Peter that during his earthly ministry in the four gospels. Where, where the other apostles had to have a quorum or two or three. He says, where two or three are gathered uh, in my name, there I am in the midst of you, speaking of his apostles. Uh, Peter himself had, that, that had the unique privilege and honor of having the keys of that earthly kingdom, and he himself could uh, uh, bind and loose. And, and you see that in Acts chapter 8 when Peter was dealing with Simon the sorcerer. Uh, Peter was able to remit his sins, but also retain his sins, as it says in John 20. But when it comes to the dispensation of grace, the one whom God has magnified, Romans 11, 13, is the Apostle Paul. And here is, a, is, a, is, a, is a, uh, an example of that. <clears throat> Verse number 14, but when I saw that they, that's Peter, Barnabas, and the rest of those Jewish apostles and, and elders, walk not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. That truth of the gospel is there is no difference today between the Jew and the Gentile in the dispensation of grace. I said unto Peter before them all, Paul's going to rebuke him in public. If thou being, by the way, by rebuke him in public, Paul is not trying to be mean to Peter. Uh, Paul wasn't a confrontational person uh, uh, in in his, as far as uh, uh, his natural personality. He, He says with the meekness, and, and, and gentleness of Christ, he would deal with the Corinthians if, if, if need be. But he, he, he says, Peter already knew these things about the truth of the gospel. Paul, when he got saved, if you go back to Galatians 1, go back to Galatians 1, when Paul first got saved in Acts chapter 9, Paul, look at verse 16, speaking about God calling him by his grace, Galatians 1, 16, he says, to reveal his son in me, speaking of, of the apostle that I might preach him among the heathen, heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Paul, when he got saved in Acts 9, didn't go back to any men, particularly the apostles there at Jerusalem. He was at Damascus. Notice what happened, verse 17. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me. Okay, Paul didn't go and, and consult them in conference with them. But I went into Arabia, and Paul mentions Arabia in chapter 4. It's Mount Sinai in Arabia. He went to the very place that God gave the law to Moses and God was superseding that law with the gospel of grace. And he says, I return and return again unto Damascus. But what I want you to see within three years of Paul's ministry, excuse his salvation in Acts 9, he says, then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. And at that time, I'm sure Paul was explaining to Peter the gospel of the grace of God and any revelation of the mystery that he would have received in that three year period. So Peter understood that there was no difference. Now, if you go to chapter two, verse one, let's add another 14 years. So 17 years 
for Paul and 14 years from his time with Peter. Look at verse one, Galatians two, verse one. Then 14 years after this is after he first saw Peter. I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me. So he went to see Peter three years after his salvation. He goes 14 years later. So Peter has had that one witness there uh, three years after Paul about there's no difference today. Peter then he himself stood up for Paul. Peter had the the the, uh, the event in Acts 10 where he say well he speaks the gospel of the kingdom but he mentions the, the, the death burial resurrection the blood of Christ as far as the the not the blood of Christ but he mentions what what the Lord did okay we now know through Paul is the blood of Christ but he mentions Christ's death burial and resurrection for he mentions uh, remission of sins Acts 10 he sees those Gentiles get saved before they are ever water baptized so Peter now knows that there's no difference in Acts 15 he stood up for Paul's ministry he says he put no difference between us and them purifying their hearts by faith. So Peter already knew what was truth about the, the gospel, okay, that there's no difference. So Paul is not trying to be mean. Go back to chapter 2, verse 16. Excuse me, verse 14. He says in verse number 14, but when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, Peter already had a witness. He knew. I said unto Peter before them all. Now, he's going to deal with Peter in public this way. To show, Paul says, them that sin, rebuke before all that others may fear. Paul was asserting his authority as the apostle of grace, and he was making Peter an, 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 an example to these other uh, circumcision uh, apostles and, and elders. Verse number 14. If thou being a Jew, livest after the manner of the Gentiles. Peter understood he wasn't under the, the restraints of that law anymore as far as uh, you know, his, his, his manner of life. It's, he says in verse 14, and not as do the Jews. By the way, he was eating with those Gentiles, the very same Gentiles in Acts 10. He says it is unlawful for us to go to another house or to even uh, deal with a Gentile. Well, look what he says. Why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Verse 15, we who are Jews by nature, we were born Jews, Paul, Peter, the rest of them, and not sinners of the Gentiles. By the way. Sinners of the Gentiles, that's how the Jews referred to the Gentile, to the heathen. They call them the sinners. Okay? You remember, you remember even the disdain that the Pharisees had towards the people of Israel. They would say that the Lord ate with publicans and sinners. And you think, wait a minute, you think they're calling them sinners. But it was more than just these people were, were living lifestyles that weren't um, you know, righteous in the eyes of the Pharisees. That was actually a derogatory term to, for their own brethren. They were, they were equating them to Gentiles. Talking about sinners of the Gentiles. That's how the, that's how the Jews referred to the, the heathen. Verse number 16. Knowing, now here's what we want to see. He says to Peter, we know this. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Now when he talks about justified by the works of the law, when we talk about justification... We usually mean uh, talk about it in, in reference to positional uh, to our position in Christ. Right. You trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your savior and positionally you're righteous before God. Justification means righteousness or right. Yeah. Right. Just justification means righteousness before God. Now, there's a couple of ways that we talk about it. Usually when we talk about justification, I just want to write this on the board so I can have it for you guys. It means what that means is a righteous righteous standing okay and it doesn't always have to be before god it's just it, that's just the general thing context is everything yeah context is everything we're going to talk we're going to see that but usually when we talk about our justification we're talking about our salvation from hell okay that's that's the usual context of it as well as our position in christ i just had a guy email me today i'm able i'm still think i can get to him right away now he says, somebody says that being in Christ in Romans 16 means that Acts 2 is where the church, the body of Christ began. Because Paul says those apostles who were in Christ before him. I said, no, in Christ, both the little flock as well as the body of Christ are both in Christ. The Lord says, you, he tells his apostles and, and his disciples, he says, you must abide in me. OK, there's a John. video on the YouTube channel too yeah. called in Christ versus the body of Christ. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah, because we've gone over this. So that's what I explained. Good. I'll let them know that. I'll mm -hmm. send them that's right. Ryan always reminds me we do so many of these. 
But when we talk about in Christ, it's positional righteousness, okay? And they needed it as well, the, the little flock. Ours is done by faith alone forever. Theirs is a faith plus works, a continuation. It's a, it's a package deal. Their, their, salva- their, their uh, position and practice. But when we talk about justification, a righteous standing, it's usually as, as far as our salvation of our souls from hell, our position in Christ. But the Bible does use, and then secondarily, we'll talk about this, this term sanctification. Okay, Sanctification. And this is usually, this is being set apart. The process, it's a process of being set apart. Now, I'm just, that it, and, and the context tells you uh, as well. Paul uses the word sanctified in, 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 in 1 Corinthians 7. The, husband, the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. And the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Not saying they're holy. When he uses that word holy, that means set apart unto God. That's being sanctified unto God, holy. Like the children. But you can use a husband. uh, If a sister is saved and she has a lost husband, her husband is sanctified. You can use him for your benefit. He's set apart for you. Physically protect you, provide for you and the children. There are things that he may not ever help you spiritually. There's other ways he can help you. So the process of sanctification, we usually talk about not our salvation, but our walk. Not our position, but our practice. Okay. so this is this is how we normally use this. But I can tell you something. It, with both of these terms, justification and sanctification, Ryan mentioned earlier about the context, that's truly important because in both of these cases, the Bible uses both of these words, justification or justified, sanctification or sanctified, not just solely for position or solely for practice, but for both. And we're going to see that. The justification of the book of Galatians here is not just or not simply you're saved by God's grace through faith and you have everlasting life. It's not just talking about your position. We're going to see that Paul is talking about, and a lot of people miss this with Galatians. They miss the Romans 7 effect. When he's talking about this justification, he's just talking about our daily righteousness, our daily righteousness in our practice as well. You're going to see that. Because the Galatians problems were, the Galatianism was they were trying to live under the law. They were already saved, okay? They knew they were saved. In fact, we're going to see later in chapter 3, they had the miracle signs and wonders. They had the gifts of the Spirit in operation. It was no doubt they were saved. They differed in Christendom today. Today, people wonder, am I really saved? Am I not saved? They didn't have that problem. They were saved. Their problem was they were trying to be righteous under the law. They were trying to be justified daily under the law. We're going to look at that, okay? So... Now, let's look at it. Oh, by the way, that whole thing about Paul withstanding Peter. Remember what I said? Paul wasn't trying to be mean. Peter had a testimony from God already. I wrote this down. God has made it so that you're corrected by his word. Okay. Mm -hmm. God don't want to have people coming at you, correcting you all the time. That's the second level of defense uh, uh, spiritually. God wants a man's heart. To take his word. By the way, think about this. Think about David. God told Israel to write that that if you're going to have a king, I I know you guys want a king, 1 Samuel. They chose Saul. He told Samuel, he says, Samuel, they're not rejecting you. They rejected me. Okay, if they want a king like all the other nations, which is crazy, they don't want me to be their king? Fine. Here's the king. They're going to take your sons. For warriors, they're going to take your sons for servants. They're going to take your, your daughters for maid servants. They're going to take them to do all this stuff. We're going to, they're, going to take, they're going to tax you. They're going to take money for its defense. Okay, if you want it, let's do it. Okay? Um, but he talks about, sir, but um, they, they, don't want, they want to kick. Sorry about that. It was so much, and I was just reading that today. God has made us to be by his word. Oh, yeah. So, David, so he says, but if you want, thank you, David. That's what I love. He says, when that king goes to the throne, you make sure you give him a copy of the law. He's to write himself a copy and read his law because nobody can correct the king. There's no man that's going to stand before a king. OK. But what God has used to, to, to correct the king was the scripture. Mm-hmm. Now, when that didn't happen with David, when his heart went out and committed the adultery, it started. The Lord says adultery starts in your heart. 
When his heart did that, he did the action with Bathsheba. God then sends a man named Nathan the prophet to correct him. Okay, everybody know that. So what God desires is that a man takes his, his heart softly and looks into the scriptures and is corrected by the scriptures, renewed by the scriptures. But if that doesn't happen, remember Paul says, and if any man be otherwise minded, even God shall reveal this unto you. The first way he does it is through his word. God wants you to be corrected by the word. But if that doesn't happen, then there's the human intervention where a man like Nathan or a brother or sister in the Lord say, here's what the word of God says, brother or sister. Listen, God, that, God, that's the second level. OK, that's what Peter happened to Peter. Peter should have known the truth of the gospel. So now Paul has to intervene. OK, so he wasn't being mean. So if, if you don't use the truth of God's word to correct you, then the next level of intervention are other saints. OK, go, go to Leviticus chapter number 19. This has always been through the scriptures. And during my time now, I'm just going verse by verse through the Holy Scriptures just for my own refreshing and, you know, uh, just building on just all the understanding I already have. It's going to be a nice refreshing and I'm just taking things in. As I was reading Leviticus chapter 19, look at verse 17. It's interesting that right there in the law, God tells Israel, verse 17, Leviticus 19, 17, Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. By the way, the Lord Jesus Christ later says, if you hate your brother, you've committed murder in your heart. Don't hate him. You said 1719? 1970. Did I say? I'm sorry. Other way around. I said 1719? Okay. No. 1917. Sorry about that. <laughs> sorry about that. Got it? 1917. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in any wise, notice, rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him interesting God says don't hate your brother just don't allow him to just fester in his sin go and help him out if, if the word is obviously you know give him space but if the word obviously not doing gently go over there and say hey man you, you don't want to do this if you love him you'll tell him his fault Paul says it like this in Galatians if a man is overtaken with a fault Ye which are spiritual, restore. You're always looking for restoration. Restore such a one, but you got to do it in the right spirit, the spirit of meekness. And he says, considering thyself, lest I also be tempted. Don't look down on him. Say, hey, but by the grace of God, I'll be in your position, but let me help you restore yourself. That's what he's saying there. But it's interesting. He says, you, you should not suffer sin upon him. And so what Paul is doing, he's trying to rebuke Peter to the point where he says, listen, man. Don't you do this grievous sin for the Lord? Don't you have these Gentiles thinking they need to be Jews? You know, in Christendom, they allow these people who call themselves Jews or these Messianic Jews or even these people who put Israel up here, the people who hate the Lord today, that nation, and they just think it's something special. But listen, in, in, in prophecy, yes. In the mystery, no. That, that's not, you're not, God is not looking for you to be Jewish. Going back to your Jewish Hebrew roots. We were talking about the brother when we got to Minnesota. Remember Chris Heave, right? And I used to tell that guy, you're a Gentile, man. Stop trying to be a Jew. I wanted to tell him. <laughs> you don't, Peter got in trouble for that. He was a real Jew, Chris, okay? Listen, don't do that stuff. You don't need that stuff. Paul says, art thou called in uncircumcision? Seek not to be circumcised, 1 Corinthians 7. He says, you don't got to be doing this religious. Anyway, you don't need that Hebrew root stuff. That's a big show of the flesh is what it is, okay? Just me tell you what Paul says about that. He never put that. He never put that on Gentiles. And when Peter did, he rebuked him. Go over to Psalm 141. Psalm 141. You don't need all that stuff. All you need is who you are in Christ. Just get into Paul's epistles or ministry in Paul's epistles and be the best. You are unique. You're a unique soul. God wants you. Every joint supply. God has a part for you. You don't have to be somebody else. They don't need to be you. You don't need to be them. Be who you are. Look at Psalm 141, verse 5. This is, this is the heart of a believer, okay? Here's your heart. Let the righteous smite me. You're okay with those who love God's word like you come and say, hey, man, check this out. Maybe we could do this this way. What do you think? You know? We do that. That's, that's, the, that's the beautiful thing about having a local seminary. Some brethren say, yeah, man, check this out. I'm thinking about doing it. What do you think? Just, just let them, you know, work with you, correct, whatever. Look what he said. 
Uh, Psalm 141, verse 5. Let the righteous smite me. It shall be a kindness. And let him reprove me. It shall be an excellent oil, which shall not break my head. For yet my prayer also shall be in their calamities. In other words, he's saying, you know, I'll be there for them. The point is, God has made it so that brothers and sisters minister to one another. And if that other righteous person come and he says, smite me, it's a kindness, reprove me. In other words, we deal with each other, right? We, we say, look, I love you. I'm coming from a point of love. But it has to be that point of love and meekness. But that's a good thing. Go to Proverbs 27. Look at Proverbs 27. So that's what Paul was doing with Peter. Proverbs 7, 27, excuse me. Proverbs 27, verse 5. Proverbs 27, verse 5. Open rebuke is better than secret love. Interesting. You can claim you love them, but you want to be there to help them. Verse number six. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Interesting. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. I, I just Every time I read that, I think about the Lord Jesus. We're talking about the faith of Christ, and he was wounded, it says, for their transgression. And, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Who, who gave a kiss? You know what the Lord says to Judas? The, he says, he says, betrayeth thou the son of man with a kiss? Isn't that interesting? But I just want you to see it's okay for brothers and sisters who, who are spiritual. You don't want some fool coming to you, quite frankly. That's the truth. Okay. But if they're spiritual, if, they, if, they, if it's like Paul with Peter. By the way, I don't think there would have been anybody else who Peter would have respected to, to, to reprove him on that, in that issue than Paul. God picked the perfect person. Because if you got the keys to the earthly kingdom like Peter did, you're like, wait a minute, the Lord chose me, even out of all the apostles. But he did choose Paul too, bro. And Paul is the one he knew. Peter knew from the Cornelius thing, from the Jerusalem conference, from the whole, from Paul's time with them uh, three years after his salvation, that Paul was right. And, uh, and I'm sure Peter went on and got it right. You know, Peter, we, we understand Peter's heart. Uh, he did have a soft heart. He didn't mind. He didn't mind being reproved, but he, he, Paul needed to do it. All right, go back to uh, Galatians 2. So that's that what Peter had had to be rebuked by Paul. But that was a godly thing. Uh, by the way, that's 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 all of us. Right. If you don't let the word do it, that's where the others come in. All right. Galatians chapter number two, verse number 16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to talk about this issue of the faith of Jesus Christ. Paul is now going to focus on his faith, the faithfulness of Jesus. His complete, total, unfailing obedience to God the Father. Now, when it comes to this issue of the faith of Christ, I already wrote it up there. You see this issue of the faith of Christ. Notice that Paul in the Bible didn't say it this way. It had to do with, with faith in Christ. Now, I'm going to talk to all the people who have the other version outside the King James, out of love, okay? Even if you have the new King James, people contact me and say, Brother Ron, I, know, I don't have the NIV and all these other, but I had the new King James just real close. Well, bro, sis, where it's not close is when it comes to this issue of the faith of Jesus Christ. And even something as subtle as changing of to end, it goes from dealing with his perfect faith, the faith of Jesus Christ, our Lord, to our imperfect faith. And if you're comfortable standing before the Lord Jesus at the judgment seat of Christ, Hearing this, saying there is a Bible that will magnify the faith of Christ and your new King James and all the rest of them. Don't do that. They change faith of Jesus Christ into faith in Jesus Christ from his faith, his perfect faith to our imperfect faith. If you're comfortable with, with when, when you stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, the judgment seat of Christ. And he says, now you heard the message about, you know, th those other ones, they, 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 they seek nothing but to cast me down from my excellency. The King James cast, you know, gave me my due. If you're comfortable saying, you know what, Lord, for all these different reasons, I, I just decided to stay with that. Well, that's fine because you're going to have to talk to him about that. But I, my job is to let you know out of love. The faith of Jesus Christ is the issue with God. And even in the new King James, it changes that faith of Jesus Christ all the time. Go over to Romans chapter number three. So if you're comfortable with standing before the Lord using an inferior 
version, just because so-called easier and all this stuff, but it's messing with the doctrine. Hey, between you and the Lord, but don't say you weren't warned. When it comes to God, the faith of his son, Jesus Christ, is the issue. Look at Romans chapter 3, verse number 20. Romans 3, verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. This is a dispensational chain. Verse 21. But now, this is in the dispensation of grace, the righteousness of God without the law. Time passed. There was righteousness. The righteousness of God was right in that law. Paul in Philippians 3 says, he says, he says, as touching the righteousness which is in the law, he was blameless. But now, in the dispensation of grace, God has revealed something new. He's manifested something new. What is that? Verse 21, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The law and the prophets pointed to this. It testified of this coming righteousness. What's that? Even, that is, verse 22, the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. The new King James changed that like all the rest of them. It says by faith in Jesus Christ. See, his faith is the issue. His perfect faith. The perfect faith of Jesus Christ is the issue. That's why God can justify us by faith. Because when we trust Christ, God, he's the power source. His faith is the power source. We plug right on into that. Watch what this verse says. Verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. Now, notice where our faith comes in unto all. So that 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 salvation based upon his faithfulness is, is, is unto all. God, through Paul, gives it to all. But not everybody gets saved. It says, and upon all them that believe, believe faith activates the faith of Jesus Christ. No matter how powerful his faithfulness was, there's no way it can benefit you unless you tap into it by faith. Right. Romans 5, verse 1, therefore being justified by faith. That's our positional righteousness, salvation. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace. In order to access the faith of Christ, you have to access it by faith, whether it's for your positional righteousness or your practical righteousness. There's a walk of faith. It's still the faith of Jesus Christ. So don't, don't, don't use a Bible that changed this. You, if, if, you, if, you're, if you're that comfortable knowing that your version of the Bible is taken away from the Lord's glory, wow, and you're willing to stand before him that way, give him some excuses while you're using it, that's, that's crazy to me, but that's between you and the Lord. He is the issue. Notice, unto all that believe, for there is no difference, in the verse means uh, Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace, through the redemption that is in. By the way, when he calls him Christ Jesus. He, in verse 22, he says, Jesus Christ, that's the person. In Christ Jesus, that has that focus is on his suffering at Calvary and the glory that shall be revealed. OK, his suffering is the issue with Christ. Jesus. Here's the point. The faith of Jesus Christ is the issue. Go to Philippians three. Go over to Philippians chapter three. All these passages the New King James changes as well, and all the rest. By the way, in Acts 3.26, the New King James says, Servant, capital S-E-R-V-A-N-T. The King James says, Son. There's a huge difference in the Bible between a servant and a son. The whole book of Galatians chapter 4, Paul says, Now you are no longer a servant, but a son. So if, you're, if your King, New King James calls him a servant when the King James calls him a son, and you fine with that, and you tell him that, 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 that that's between you. But let me tell you, God's word magnifies the faith of Jesus Christ. Look at verse number eight, Philippians three, verse eight. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss. All that religious pedigree, that, that righteousness he had in the law and all that, for the excellency of the thing that excels, of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. See that issue of Christ Jesus has to do with that message the preaching of the cross, the, 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 the suffering, the message that he suffered for, the mystery. My Lord, my, my righteous judge. Verse 8. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things. See, Paul was willing to suffer the loss of those things. By the way, you know what one of them was? Oh, boy. You know what you get a lot now? The praise of men. 
What I'm seeing in these last days, boy, you, you got these guys, they love the praise of man. Paul had that. You know what the Lord said? Right now we're talking about the long robes and long clothing. The Lord says, these old Pharisees, he says, you hypocrites, you walk around in long robes and long clothes, clothing, religious clothing investments that say, hey, look at me. I'm a religious dude. And they love the praise of men at the markets. Hey, Rabbi. Hey, teacher. Hey, pastor. Saw you at that conference. Like, boy, it was... And they just soak it up instead of saying, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Somebody give me a comment and say, praise the Lord. It's all about the Lord. See, Paul says, I suffer the loss of all that nonsense and do count it, but count them but dung. Verse eight. He says, it's nothing but cow dung. Why did you do that, Paul, that I may win Christ? Paul says the issue is winning Christ, that, 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 that high calling of God in Christ. And he didn't want any of that other stuff to hinder him. Paul's in a race here. Verse number nine. And here's the key. And be found when the Lord returns and be found in him. Remember, in first Corinthians four, Paul says it, it, it is moreover it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. This is it. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law. You know that blamelessness of the law? It says about Zacharias and Elizabeth. They were both, Luke 1, verse 5 and 6. They were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinance blame. When Paul says, lest any man should boast, you can say, look what I'm doing. I get these emails and these people, and they may have just heard one message, and they, so they're in religion, they're coming. And they talk about all, the whole thing is about what they're doing. Remember, we went to Brother James Mason funeral, his friend back from from this guy. He spent a half an hour telling us all the stuff he was doing. Well, I'm doing this and I'm doing that and we're doing this and we're doing that. And, just, and I'm just looking at him, mm -hmm. this dude ain't mentioned nothing about the Lord. Here, the Lord doing it. Everything. It was all what he's doing. I get these emails. Brother Ron, we're doing this, we're doing that, we're doing this, we're doing that. I said, okay, but you ain't teaching the mystery. Listen, and be, verse 9, and be found in him, in him. Not just positionally, because look, like we were saying, when you get saved, you're in him. You're in Christ. Paul is talking about this right here. Be found in his walk, his practice. He wanted that, he wanted his position, he wanted his practice to live up to the position. He wanted the process of being set apart. He wanted the fruits of righteousness. Yeah. He wanted those fruits. He says it earlier in, in Philippians. Fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, the praise and glory of God. Paul wanted that crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give him at that day. Second Timothy 4. Look what he said. Verse 9. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ. The, the New King James changed that one too. It says that which is something about the faith in Christ. But it's not our faith the issue, it's his faith. Notice, the righteousness which is of God by faith. How do you tap into the faith of Christ as a believer in your walk? It's by faith. You take it in, God's word through the Apostle Paul, Believing it and letting it work in and through you. That's what Paul was doing. He wasn't trying to keep the law. That's important because if you go back to Galatians, go back to Galatians 2. Paul had to learn this. I, am, I have no doubt that God had Paul write the book of Galatians. Right after he had that Romans 7 struggle. We'll, we'll be seeing Romans 7 in, in a little bit. But Paul had a Romans 7 struggle. He got saved by God's grace out of the, the, the religious system of Israel. He was walking comfortably in his grace, soaking it up. But then his flesh, his religious flesh. Now, the, what we just read in Philippians, that's 30 years later, right? He, he, had, he had learned. But early in his life, even before he wrote the book of Galatians, the first book he wrote, but he had this struggle, that Romans 7 struggle. Okay, I, I have to go back to doing all these things that the law says in order to please God. That's all he knew. And even those who come to know the grace of God, they, it's hard for them to get out of that religious, legalistic, denominational system, that leaven in their mind, that corruption. And I'm always trying to pull them out, pull them out, pull them out. 
Paul had that struggle, and I, I, I guarantee you God let him go through that Romans 7 struggle right before he wrote the book of Galatians. So it's nice. That's why he says, I wrote it with my own hand. Let me tell you guys, I know the struggle. Look at Galatians chapter 2. He says, verse number 16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. And he's not just talking about positionally. Trying to walk under the law. That's the problem of Galatianism. They were trying to please God under the law. But by the faith of Jesus Christ, verse 16, even we have believed in Jesus Christ. By the way, that, that was their positional righteousness. That, that, was, that was back there. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ. That, what's the purpose? That we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law... Uh, shall no flesh be justified. Now, look at the next. Let me write. The, let me let me read it. You say you say you see where it says we might be justified. When you see might in scripture, think might or might not. Chris and I laugh at our little girl because she's honest as can be and strong will. And we'll talk about her about believing in the Lord when she gets old. She goes, oh, might or might not. <laughs> Thank you for your honesty. She's right. She got to make the choice. It says might. Uh, justified is not just a positional thing. We talk about it. Justification, sanctification. I just went over that. Uh, sanctification is not just a practical thing. There's a positional justification, a practical justification. There's a positional sanctification, a practical sanctification. Context is always the key. Uh, I mentioned how justification means to be declared righteous. Um, look at look at Romans chapter 5, verse 1. So let's look at these different things in context. We'll go to Romans 5, verse 1. I quoted it, but we'll look at it. Romans 5, verse 1. In Romans 5, verse 1, here's a positional justification. Verse number 1. Therefore, being justified, that's where we're at before God, by faith, we trusted Christ. We have, that's a current possession, peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I talk to so many saints and hear from so many saints that until they come to know the grace of God, that they can rest in their salvation, rest in their salvation, not their sanctification, their salvation, they can't have a peace. Am I saved today? Am I pleasing God? Listen, once you trust Christ, you have peace with God. God is no longer upset at you. He can, you can grieve him, but he loves you. You're his child. He, you, you have it. Positionally, you're saved from hell. You're so, you're, you're in, you have a righteous standing for God. Okay? But notice in chapter 3, let me show you about this issue of justification when it comes to not, not a position of righteousness as far as, you know, salvation. Look at Romans 3, verse 4. Uh, start at verse 1. What advantage then have the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way. Okay, when God created the nation of Israel, gave them that law. Chiefly, the, the number one thing that made them special is this. Because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. God's word was the number one issue with Israel. Verse 3. For what if some did not believe? That happened. Shall their unbelief make the, fa ah, the faith of God a non-effect? See, there's the faith of Christ and the faith of... When you talk about the faith, faith of Christ and faith of God, we're talking about his faithfulness, okay? <coughs> if Israel didn't believe God's promise, is that going to affect God's faithfulness? No. Um... I was going through my old emails, and uh, Ryan had sent this email about from his brother Tom Tom Boucher, and he didn't want to get into the issue of the joint and stuff. He sees it like we did. <laughs> it's funny. He was breaking down Romans eight seventeen and Second Timothy two twelve like like I would have said. He was like, "Look, if we suffer, we shall reign with him." There's our position: reign. If we deny him, we refuse to suffer in the mystery. We will not reign with him. Then he goes, but that doesn't mean you lose your salvation. The next verse says, if we believe not yet he abideth faithful, you cannot deny himself. He's going to be faithful to get us to heaven because he promised by his grace we're saved. You're going to get to heaven, but you won't, you won't reign with him. He was right on, but he didn't want to say nothing. He can't deny himself because his faith <laughs> exactly. keeps us saved. That's right, and that's and what that's we him. tapped in. That's right. And so he can't, he's faithful. And, 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 and God is faithful to the nation of Israel. That's what Paul is saying there. Verse 3, Romans 3, 3. For what if some of those Jews didn't believe? Many of them didn't. Shall their unbelief, is their unbelief 
gonna gonna make a difference to God? Nope. Make the faith of God without effect. No, God still is gonna be faithful. Ah, verse number four. Now a lot of people quote this out of context, but I want to I want to show you what Paul is talking about here. I know what they mean, but just let it say what it's to say. He's a, it's a quote for the Book of Psalm fifty one. Here we go. God forbid. If those unbelieving Jews don't believe God's word, is that going to make God's word not of non-effect? Paul says, "Uh, uh-uh, God forbid. Strongest protest in scripture. Yay. Let God be true. But every man a liar as it is written. Okay. That thou mightest be justified in thy sayings. Now, wait a minute. How is it that God has to be justified? He's He's righteous. But see, this justified, this righteous, has nothing to do with his standing, his position, his salvation. It means, well, it doesn't stand. It means when he speaks, he's righteous in, his, in what he says. Notice he says, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. Now, what Paul is alluding to here, he, he, the Spirit of God through Paul, he, gi- he gives you commentary on Psalm 51, verse 4. In Psalm 51, when David is dealing with his sin, he says that thou mightest be justified in thy saying and and, and mightest overcome when thou judgest. So Psalms talks about when God judges men. In Psalms it says when thou speakest. When thou speakest, yes, when when he speakest, right? Here, when thou art judged. So here, what he's going to speak about Mm -hmm. is at these judgments, when God condemns a person, right? That person is going to be saying, but God, you are not fair. And here, the Spirit of God takes that and says, wait a minute, and might as overcome when thou art judged. How is God himself going to be judged? Because he's going to let people make their defense. Psalm 51 says, and be clear when thou judgest. Ah, be clear when thou judgest. Thank you. So the righteous judge is going to say, okay, I know, I know the sentence I have for you. Tell me why it's wrong. Tell, make your best case. And they won't be able to do it. So the point is, when it comes to... It makes me think about Paul telling, talking to the... Uh, Corinthians about clearing themselves. It's right? a clearance of themselves. Second Corinthians right. seven. So having nothing that anybody can say against you. Clear it's a cl- you got to clear yourself. And that, by the way, that's true repentance. Clearing. Mm-hmm. You can't just say, "Oh, I did this." Well, I'm sorry. Let's just sweep it under the rug. I'll move on. No, no, no. That's the politician. I don't want to. They do something yesterday. I'm sorry for that. Let's just move on. No, man. I take full responsibility for my. Well, you got to make it right. You got to clear yourself, and that's what it's about. That thou mightest be justified. So there's a use of justification when it comes to God Himself. He's going to be declared righteous by what He speaks. Be okay. Clear of any accusation. Clear of any accusation. That's a good. One. Yep. Clear. You're going to be clear. Yep. Or clear. Yep. Thank yep. It is. Yes. Good. Good. That's great. Yep. All so, right. So the uh, context of that of Romans three four is the. Judgments. Of yeah, that's the judgments of God. Mm-hmm. And when you go on to read the rest of it, that's exactly what it's about. Mm-hmm. By the way, in our little ten-minute studies online, I'm actually going through Romans, so I'm gonna be talking about all this. But yes, it's the, ju- the the context is the judgments of God. God is gonna be make judgments, but people are gonna get a chance to to speak to the judge and say, "Oh, judge, this is why you're wrong." He said, "All right, lay out your case." And guess what? He always gonna overcome. <laughs> he's always gonna overcome. He's at the end. He's gonna be declared righteous and clear in his judgment. Now, there's an issue of justification or justified that's not a positional or salvation issue. So the context I wanted to show you is key. I'll show you one more. Um, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4. This is one that we uh, talk about a, a number of times. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul is saved. He's the apostle. But he's going to talk about being justified. 1 Corinthians chapter number 4, Paul says, uh, start at verse 3. But with me, speaking of the apostle, it is a, not just a small thing, it's like a speck of dust to him. It is, a, you know what, it, it's true. What he's about to say, when you understand God's word, when you've labored in it like Paul, when you've dedicated your life to it like that, and some little nitwit come try to poke, you know, kind of cues into it, he's like, shut up, it's a small thing. That's what Paul was, he got these, these baby Corinthians who ain't did a darn thing for the Lord, and Paul's been in ministry all these years, literally almost to the point of death, getting beat down for the Lord, bearing his body. And he looks at them and says, y'all going to stand and judge me? He said, man, it's a speck. It's like with my seven-year-old. I tell her, I said, I don't care what you got to say about nothing. you seven. I love you, but I don't care about you complaining about what your mother and I decided to do. 
That's how Paul is spiritually. He goes, verse three, but with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you. <laughs> I think about that. Like if we grace believers, yeah, what the lost people say, just expect them to say dumb things about, about you because they're lost. They're, their minds are corrupt. He says, even, even these saints, Paul was so, so more spiritual than they were. He was like, or man's judgment. He says, I don't care any man's judgment, any human being's judgment. I don't, I don't worry about that. In fact, just to be on the safe side, he says, yea, I judge not mine own self. Paul understood he himself in his, in his humanity. That wasn't the issue. He wanted to make sure his judgment was based upon the truth of God's word. Watch what he said. For I know, he's not saying he didn't know anything. He just says, I know nothing by myself. I'm not going to use my own human wisdom to, to work this out. He's going to use the word. Because, by the way, he does say later, he says over in 2 Corinthians, prove your own self. Examine yourselves through the word, he means, whether you be in the faith. Okay, we are to judge ourselves. Okay, here we go. But he, oh, sorry, verse 4, for I know nothing by myself. Yet am I not hereby, notice, justified. Now, Paul is not talking about being justified position of salvation. He got saved years and years and years ago. He's talking about here in his righteous walk. He goes, he goes um, that's not the issue. He says, for I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified. But he that judgeth me is the Lord. And the Lord obviously means righteous judge. So I want you to see another time where the issue of justified or justification is not just simply an issue of salvation or position, but it has to do as part of the walk. The context is will tell you, okay? Um, also, with sanctification, just while we're on it, we usually use it as the issue of the process of being set apart in our walk or practice, and that's true. It's the main way. But there are times where sanctified or sanctification, I actually used one where in 1 Corinthians 7, the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife and vice versa. That's not a process of being set apart unto God. That's not a spiritual thing. He's sanctified. That lost dude is to his saved wife and vice versa because God created the husband to be her rest. And I can tell you now, Chris and I were talking about it. Just having that man in that, in that woman's life will give her some rest emotionally. That's why Paul says, I will, therefore, that the younger women marry. It'll keep you out of 90 percent of the worrying, 90 percent of the gossip, all that, all that stuff that women just naturally get into. Having that man says, look, woman, stop all that stuff. Having that sounding board in your life, that helps a woman. And that's how her husband sanctified unto her. Right. Plus physical protection, providing for all those things, her needs and so forth. OK, a lost man could do that. He just won't help you spiritually. Well, here in this issue of sanctification, it means to be set apart. Look at look at First uh, Corinthians. You in chapter uh, four, go back to chapter number one. Look at First Corinthians, chapter number one, verse two. We all know the carnal Corinthians. Corinthianism, that they were living in their carnal flesh, rejecting the, the, the wisdom of God and the mystery in their walk. But notice what Paul calls them. Look at first Corinthians, chapter number one, verse two. Unto the church of God. It's the church of God. So they're saved. There's no doubt they're saved. It's called the church of God, which is at Corinth to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. And then he says, called to be saints. Now, let me show you something. Watch this. He said they are. He's using that word sanctified in a positional deal. He says, you old carnal Corinthians, you're the church of God. You are right now presently sanctified in him in, in Christ Jesus so there's a there's there's sanctification used as a, as a position okay just want to show you that but then in the same verse that's why I want you to see this verse it says called to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of our of Jesus Christ our Lord both theirs and ours the theirs is the little flock at that time because there's a group of them and ours the body okay this is a unique time where both the little flock and the body but here's the point Notice in that verse, sanctified is used positionally. You are sanctified, although they weren't operating in it. But he said, hey, God has called you to be saints, set apart unto him. So we're sanctified, but called to walk in that sanctified position. Okay. 
That's two in one verse. Look at verse 30. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, verse 30. But of him, speaking of the Father, of him are ye, the Corinthians, in Christ Jesus, he suffered for this, who of God, now watch this, who of God is made unto us wisdom. They weren't operating that wisdom. Righteousness. He had to tell them in chapter 15, awake to righteousness and sin not. They were sleeping on the righteousness. He says, but he's your righteousness. And sanctification. Positionally, he's their sanctification. And the last thing, and their redemption, okay? We talked about that in our study at Twin Cities Grace Fellowship, our complete redemption. So there are times where Paul uses his word sanctification as far as position. These people were sanctified, but they weren't operating in it. So I just want, since, so even when you're dealing with justification and sanctification, the context, we did that study about the toolbox, the number one tool is context. Every, everything in scripture is context, 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 okay? All right, I just want you to see that. Uh, go to chapter 6, verse 11, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 11. Talking about all these, uh, verse 9, 6, verse 9, verse 9, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor infeminate, nor abuse of themselves with mankind. By the way, the Corinthians were doing every one of these sins currently in their assemblies. The guy in chapter 5 was fornicating with his father's wife. They were idolaters. They were going to the t idol temples with the temple prostitutes, the priestess. Adulterers, infeminate, nor abuse of themselves with mankind. Verse 10, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunk. They, in chapter 11, they, at the Lord's Supper, well, he didn't call it the Lord's Supper because they, they really didn't dedicate, they weren't doing it the right. They were getting drunk. It says, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. But this is not Paul telling these saints they won't get it. Colossians says we have been translated at the moment we're saved into the kingdom of his dear son. So what is he talking about? Verse 11. And such were some of you. But ye are washed. But ye are sanctified. But ye are justified. In the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. See, what the, the Lord has done and what the Spirit does, he's saying, look, by the way, he used both of those terms in the same verse. You're sanctified, you're justified, okay? Because of who they are in Christ, they have these benefits. Now, Paul says, now walk in them. So I just want you to see, when you're dealing with justification, sanctification, make sure you're always looking at that context, okay? Um, we mentioned the one, go over to chapter 7, verse 14. Just to look at it. 7, 14. For the unbelief, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. Here's a lost dude or an unbelieving person sanctified by the wife and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. Now, holy means set apart unto God. OK, uh, one more. Go to first Timothy four when it comes to foods. First Timothy four. So you can use sanctified is not always the process for the believers walk and practice. The context is going to tell you. Notice how he uses over here. First Timothy 4 verse 5. Uh, verse 4. For every creature of God is good. Speaking of meats. And nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. <coughs> for it is sanctified. Set apart by God for our use. By the word of God. And Paul, God says you know what? It's clean. You can eat it. And you thank God for it. So I just want you to see context is everything. Now, as we come down in, no, notice his faith is the issue. Go back to Acts chapter 26. When the Lord talks to Paul, talked to Paul on the road to Damascus, he, he let him in to some, let him know some things. If you look at Acts chapter 26 and verse number 13, when we talk about the faith of Christ, Acts 26, 13, at midday, O king, Paul says, I saw in the way a light from heaven. Now, I want you guys to notice something. It says above the brightness of the sun. This was at the, in the middle of the day. And if you've ever been in the Middle East, 
that hot sun and bright as it is. By the way, when the Lord Jesus Christ was transfigured there on the Mount of Transfiguration there in Tyre and Zidon, Mount Hermon, Mount, Mount Sion there, it says he shone as the sun. That's his prophetic glory. But the mystery, have Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3, there's a glory that excelleth. He says here, not he, he's shown as the sun. In verse 13, it was above the brightness of the sun. The, 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 the glory of grace is above that of the prophetic law, above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me and them. The glory of the mystery is greater than prophecy is what he's saying. Shining round about me and them that journey with me. Verse 14, and when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecuted thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. He was being convicted. Verse 15, and I said, who art thou, Lord? And he says, I am Jesus whom thou persecuted. But rise and stand upon thy feet. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I will, in the which I will appear unto thee. By the way, if you want to show somebody about Paul's ministry, do what he does. He always goes back to the road to Damascus. That's what I do. I always say, why Paul? And then I go why, uh, right to the, to the road to Damascus, Acts 9, and 22 and 26. Verse number 17. Delivering thee from the people. I mentioned this in my study in the book of Romans. It says, separated unto the gospel of God. God separated Paul. He delivered him from the people of Israel and from the Gentiles. When, when God began the dispensation of grace, Israel was up here, the people of Israel, and the Gentiles were down here. Gentiles didn't come up. Israel went down. The ground is level at the foot of the cross, as they say, right? So now God concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. But there's the mercy of God and the grace of God and in, in, in the grace message, gospel of grace. And now, Paul, right out of those people, God separates Paul from that mass of humanity, Jew and Gentile, and makes him unique. Okay? He picks him. He says, delivering thee from the people, that's the people of Israel, and from the Gentiles. Paul was a Jew and a Gentile in one man, like the body. Unto whom now I send thee. Now what is he going to do? I want you guys to watch verse 18. To open their eyes. Now you know he means spiritual eyes. Okay. And to turn them from darkness to light. He took us out of the kingdom of darkness and transformed to the king, translated into the kingdom of this, his dear son. Colossians 1.13. And from the power of Satan, every lost person is on the power of Satan. Unto God. Now, if you get saved, you can be under the power of God. Although Satan does control many believers, evil workers, unbelief, and so forth in the believers. He, ha he holds them captive, 2 Timothy 2. That they may receive forgiveness of sins. Now, that's, that's, the, that's an error right there. That's your position. The moment you trust Christ, you receive forgiveness of sins not remission forgiveness but not just that comma and inheritance among them by the way the forgiveness of sins makes you an heir right there you're an heir of god you're in the kingdom of his dear son so you are already an heir you you receive an inheritance that's uh you have you have you you're gonna you have citizenship, citizenship in the heavenly places, and you're going to get a glorious body like his. Okay, Now watch this. But there's more that he's offering. There's an issue of being a joint heir with Christ, suffering with him. Watch this. So you get the forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them. So it's just it's going to be a, some them, some us, which are sanctified by faith that is in me. That's the faith of Christ. And so what, what's going to happen with the joint heirs, we are the ones who tap into by faith, who access by faith, the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. And when we do, that inheritance he's talking about is more than just the heavenly places and a new body. This has to do with, he calls it in Colossians 3.24, the reward of the inheritance for serving the Lord. That has to do with reigning with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. 
If we deny him, he will deny us the rain. That's what he's talking about. It's a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give us at that day. Okay? So we have to come to an end, but when it comes to the faith of Christ, his faith, by the way, go back to Galatians, let's end there. It's in our walk. It's not, so I, I, as we're going to go through Galatians, and I've seen this even more, that's why I wanted to do it again, because I, did, I didn't grasp the, the, the fullness of this back in 06 when I taught it 10 years ago. It's obviously in 10 years, you grow, you get light. You should, even if you're a preacher, especially if you're a preacher. And, 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 and everything just pops off the page. The Galatians were trying to be sanctified, to live, to, to, have their, to have their walk be by the law, by religion. Today, now there's no law of Moses today operating in these places. Well, most of it. But it is some religion, religion, trying to bind yourself back. Today it's legalism. It's denominationalism, okay? That's another word. It's all these denominations. Denominations, okay. That's what's going on, okay? It's just like walking under the law. They're trying to do it without the rightly divided word. Uh, go, go look, at, look at verse 17. Galatians 2, 17. And then we'll... Now watch this. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, that tells you that that's not... His salvation. He's already past salvation. This is something right now. But while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. So what if you're trying to walk by faith, by the faith of Christ, but you then get into a sinful lifestyle? That, that's the question that people ask. They say if we're saved by God's grace positionally and we have eternal security, everlasting life is free gift. What happens when someone gets caught up in some sinful lifestyle? See, that's you're just telling people, Brother Ron, by teaching that. That you can live however you want, which in their mind think, oh, well, you can just live in sin. That's watch this. Watch this. Verse 17. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, living by grace. We ourselves, now you don't put it on the Lord, we ourselves also are found sinners. Is there for? See, people, this is what Paul breaking out. People are going to say, you can't teach the grace of God. They're going to blame God or God's grace that people live like that. They say, see, by teaching God's grace, people just, it's just going to make it easy for them to live. Paul says, no, no, don't put that on the Lord. Wait a minute. And we'll end in Romans 6. Is it? Verse 17. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore. Is it the Lord's fault? Is Christ the minister of sin and the strongest protest of Scripture? God forbid. Don't you blame God for your sin. Listen, I'm to teach God's grace, but that don't mean you ought to go and, and, and abuse and presume on God's grace. Let's end. Well, we'll pick up verse 18 next week. A lot of people will pick up verse 18. Let me read it, and then we'll end in Romans 6. For if I build again the things which I destroy, I make myself a transgression. We're going to pick that up next week, but go to Romans 6. I always remember, I always got to remember with Krista sitting there, that was one of the first conversations we had. She understood God's grace, and I made it even clearer. And she says, well, what's the difference between grace and license, you know, freedom and license, something like that? Because she understands, and people get it, that, okay, if we have eternal security, we can't lose our salvation, no matter what we do, and you don't hear that from denominations, then aren't you just telling people, they can live however they want. I'm not. The Bible's not. He set you free not to sin but to serve. I'm just going to quote Galatians 5.13. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty as an occasion to the flesh. He says use your liberty but not to the flesh. The religious flesh or the carnal flesh. But by love serve one another. What do we occupy ourselves with? Using the freedom we have to serve one another. I get up every day, thank God. Six in the morning, say, yep, Lord, I'm ready to serve. Ready to serve the saints. Chris is like, you're a different man. I am. I feel free to be myself. Just get ready to go. By love, serve one another. I want to get up and serve the Lord, serve his saints. That's, that's how you walk pleasing to God. I'm not worried about, where am I going to fall into this sin or that sin? Nope. I'm getting up saying, ready to serve you, Lord. 
Get in your word, share the word, get, deal with saints. That's what he's saying. Look at Romans 6. We got to end. Verse 1. What shall we say then? You understand that eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord? What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? That's the lifestyle. He's not saying you're not going to sin. He says just continue. Just say forget it like Corinthians. I'm just going to live our own. I'm, hey, I'm saved by grace. By the way, people say that. I'm saved by grace so it don't even matter. People say that. So-called grace dispensation. Look, that grace may abound. Strongest protest of scripture. Verse 2. God, for, God forbid. Now we're going to pick up this next time we're in Galatians. How shall we? How shall we? That are dead to sin. See, You see the mechanics of it? That, that you see what's going on? If you're dead to sin, live any longer therein. God's grace, and that's what Paul is saying. You're going to see it next time. This issue of if I build again the things I destroy. Listen, don't use God's grace and the truth of it. First of all, don't tell people they're not eternally secure. They are. Don't lie about God. He gave you his grace. But also don't tell people, okay, now that you're saved forever, you can just live however you want. You can, I guess, but it's stupid. He tells you how to live. Not to not to live in sin. Okay. Anyway, we'll pick that up next time. If you're listening to this study, um, all these things we talk about, you have to do them by faith. Whether it's to be in Christ or to have Christ built in you, it's all by faith. But it starts with salvation, and you get that by trusting the Lord Jesus as your Savior. His shed blood on Calvary makes it all possible. Both to be saved and to stay saved. Yet salvation is everlasting. It's a free gift. That's God's grace. And then there's a walk of faith. His faith has the power. He just wants you to tap into it by faith. To have you walk pleasing to him. And he is more than willing, more than willing to share his inheritance of reigning for his father in the heavenly places. There's a huge heavenly places. He wants some people to delegate that authority to. That's what our strong heirs, and that's what we're going to help you with. All right, let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you, Father, for the freedom that you've given us in Christ, the liberty through the Spirit of God and through the Word of God's grace through Paul. Father, I, you know, and I have to share with the saints, I hear from people every day all around the world who are just tapping into and learning these truths of the rightly divided word and the freedom they have in Christ. They're like little babies coming out of the matrix, out of the womb. And it's wonderful to see, Father, and I can't wait to build them up. But the time is short. The Lord is at hand. May they set their faces as flints. May we all do that to redeem the time to continue to grow and learn these things and to, and to serve you in them, to, to do the labor of love in these things. Um, we're needed. The, the, the few faithful grace believers in this world, we're needed. We're really needed for one another and for the world. I mean, it's just, it's frustrating if we do look out there and even look at the body of Christ, all the backbiting and fighting and all the nonsense that goes on. It's not many of us who have just have a pure heart and want to continue to just learn your truth and share it with others with the right heart attitude. For those who are out there like that, Father, may you, may you bless them. As Paul says, have mercy on them. For they offer fresh and not afraid of a chain. Give them that same mercy you gave the house on this for us. So, Father, we thank you for the uh, ability to study your word freely tonight, to share it with others through the blessing of technology and, and Brother Ryan's labor of love in Christ. And we just pray that its fruit abound to your glory through these things. We know it's will. We know, we know it will. And we thank you for it. In Christ's name, amen.